As I announced this morning, I want to have a study with you from the Bible concerning the work and qualifications of deacons. Actually, we'll be zeroing a lot in on the work of deacons, and you can look to 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 8 through 13. 1 Timothy 3, 8 through 13. Paul writing to the young preacher, Timothy, having described the work and qualifications of those who serve as bishops or elders or presbyters, 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 7, now turns in these verses, 8 through 13, to talk about deacons. Now some of this will be repetitive from this morning, but since we're going directly into the study of deacons, we'll go back over it. You know that the word deacon comes from the Greek word diakonos. That's the word the Holy Spirit had them use. And literally, if you look into the Greek, and uh, I'm talking about Thayer right now in his Greek English lexicon, it means one who executes the commands of another, especially of a master. And it carries with the idea of hastening to get done the job assigned. Now in the New Testament, this word diakonos is variously translated, as I mentioned this morning. It is translated minister. The idea of ministering to someone means you're serving someone. Romans 13, 4 and 1 Timothy 4, 6. Certainly it would be translated into English as servant, John 12, 26. And Romans 16, 1. And then we have it simply virtually transliterated from Greek to English in the word deacon, 1 Timothy 3, 8 and 12. And then as Paul addressed the church in Philippi in Philippians 1 and verse 1 to the bishops and the deacons there. So it's evidently used by the inspired writers, not only in a general sense of every member of the church being a deacon in the general sense I say but it's used in a technical sense a position or service performed by duly qualified individuals now let's realize that these words are being used among the Greeks in their ordinary daily living and would be used by unbelievers much by believer except that the Holy Spirit employed that language and thus chose from it to use the uh, words of the Bible, or they became the words of the New Testament, to express whatever work it might be. Paul says those deacons who serve well obtain for themselves a good standing and great boldness of the faith in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 13. Obviously, that means they have serious work to do. But what exactly was the, we'll put it in quotes, work of a deacon in the New Testament church? And how did these qualifications prepare them for their work? Well, I would suggest to you that as you look at elders' qualifications, then as you look at deacons' qualifications, in both cases, except for a few qualifications, they pretty much are describing a person who is a mature Christian. And that's important to keep in mind. Let's look at, first of all, the work of deacons. Now remember the Lord purchased the church with his blood and thus the will of the Lord is manifested in his New Testament which is also sanctified by his blood and the teaching concerning the organization of the church thus is involved as we speak of the church being purchased by the blood of Christ. So we're talking about again what is authorized by Christ. It doesn't make any difference what people think when it comes to what's right or wrong. What makes a difference is what the Lord has thought and has revealed in His Word. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, James 1, verse 25. And by the way, I will do the same thing I did this morning as far as book, chapter, and verse. I won't be reading some of these because if I read all of them, we'd be here a long time. 
So I'll just be giving these for those who take notes to write down the proof text. The actual reference to deacons in the New Testament, you might be surprised, is very limited. Paul's salutation to the church at Philippi, to which I've already referred in Philippians 1 and verse 1. And then here Paul's writing to Timothy concerning the qualifications in verses 8 through 13 to 1 Timothy 3. When a church was fully organized, we spoke about last week, it would not only have elders, shepherds to oversee, but it would have deacons, according to Philippians 1 and verse 1. And there's a plurality of bishops, elders, presbyters, pastors. And we notice also that there are deacons. And they are, I, like, I still like to think of it this way because I don't know how better to think of it from what the totality of the New Testament teaches than that they're really the right-hand men of the elders. They are mature enough to where when the elders uh, want something done or decide on something, their involvement within the church is that they can trust these men to carry it out. And I think that's important. So we're asking about the work of these deacons. In the service of the New Testament church, it's generally supposed that, that that's what they did. That was their very purpose, to sit the elders. And a lot of things that might be quite temporal as far as this world's concerned. And B.W. Johnson in his commentary said their office seemed to have been to look after the temporal matters of the church especially to care for the poor and the widows. Uh, that doesn't mean they couldn't be teachers and they wouldn't be mindful of, of other things. We see that in, in Philip, who though he's not called, we'll say more about that later, a deacon, certainly he's one of those seven chosen there early on in the church's history. And what they did was certainly service of the church. Barnes says in his commentary, the word here evidently notes those who had, who had charge of the temple affairs of the church, the poor, etc. One of the things I think we have a problem with in our modern day and for a good many years now is that we again have trouble not trying to interpret, uh, or we try to interpret things in the first century as things are done now. Well, if you go back to the first century, and you think of the lifespan that people lived, which is very short compared to now, certainly. In fact, if you go back 100 years ago, it was quite short on average in general from what it is now. But there were a host of orphans and a host of widows that were quite young. And that's one reason you have a lot of that talked about in the scriptures, as well as certainly older widows. Now, there wasn't all of this stuff coming from the Roman government in the way of, of human services. It wasn't there. It didn't even exist for those like Paul who were Roman citizens, which carried with it a great privilege and freedom that a lot of those in the Roman Empire didn't have. If your family didn't take care of you, you didn't get taken care of. When you find the Lord talking about visiting those in prison, He's not necessarily talking about what we do today and trying to teach the truth to prisoners. He's talking about taking them something to eat. He's talking about giving them clothes to wear. He's talking about people in prison who were not criminals. They were there because they went against something that didn't suit somebody and we all know about debtors prison people could be sold by Romans to satisfy the debts they owed and sold into slavery now, life was a very cheap thing in the Roman Empire and we need to understand the truth of the gospel that meant also what it taught about the church then came in at a time when things were pitiful when it came to people's care one for another in general you couldn't expect all those Romans or the Greeks with their pagan backgrounds to have a view of things. Remember, this is a time that if you 
say, had two girls and you were going to have another baby, and lo and behold, you wanted a boy, but it turned out to be a girl. I don't like that. I just take it up on the mountains and leave it, let it be exposed. Or a child is born and it's uh, got problems, birth defects or whatever. Don't want to put up with that. You just expose it. That's what they called it. Putting it up on the mountain somewhere around and leave it there. Christians, by the way, uh, were known to go through the mountains and pick up these children and raise them and take care of them as best they could. Now, I admit that uh, we don't have that happening in the sense of live babies after they're born being put out there. But brethren, when it comes to abortion on demand, there's not one whit difference. The baby in the womb ought to be in the most protected position because of its needs at that stage of anybody could be. And yet, what's happened? The devil's seen to that. People don't have the milk of human kindness and natural affection. Did the Bible tell us there'd be people who would not have natural affection? Certainly so. So let's remember that when we look back in those days as to what people were doing, the New Testament comes along and in its teaching about the work of the church, it teaches about benevolence. Remember, one of the first problems to arise in the church at Jerusalem after it was established was that the Grecian widows, that is, those Jews who were from outside of Judea and Galilee, were being neglected in the daily ministration. What was that? No ministration? The idea of service? Well, they all came there to obey the law of Moses, and they had to stay a whole lot longer when they became Christians because they learned what it was like to be a Christian. And what transpires? Well, they sell their lands and their houses to provide for all of them. And some bodies were being neglected in distribution of food or whatever it was. At least they thought they were. And that's when you had the seven men selected to take care of all of those. So you don't think about that kind of thing nowadays. So what comes along? Well, if the family didn't take care of you, some of them didn't have family to do that. Now, if you're a Christian, guess what? You got your brethren in the Lord, your spiritual family members who are charged with doing that. Thus, you come down to James. James says, pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the widows and the orphans and their afflictions and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. The widows and orphans often are deprived of parents in their afflictions. What kind of afflictions? Mom and daddy aren't there to provide what mom and daddy normally do for the child. And the widows, what about them? They don't have anybody to take care of them as a husband normally would. Well, think of how much the Bible teaches on responsibility of the husband as the head of the house and the provider. And if any will not provide for his own, Paul says he's worse than an infidel, worse than a person who doesn't believe. Why is all that in there? Because it was not characteristically done in the whole Roman Empire. Now Jews, of course, if they kept the law of Moses, were admonished to do that. As you go through your Old Testament, notice, Testament, notice how many times the prophets get on them for neglecting the orphans and take advantage of such people as that. And if you go today into developing nations where people are very poor, at least when you compare them to us, you've got some of those same problems. And you have to deal with them. And the Bible furnishes us unto every good work. James 1.25 so the word here evidently denotes, that is, deacon, diakonos, those who are in charge of things like that. The character of their qualifications makes it clear that they were to be appointed as dispensers of alms, who should come into close personal relations with the poor. That's what the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia says about that given word. So it is that we need to be mindful of that. Many believe, and we do the study of various literature on it, 
that Acts 6, to which I referred, verses 1 through 6, was a prototype of the deacons' work. I don't know that we can say they were deacons, such as Paul describes in 1 Timothy 3. They certainly did the work of servants. They were also, had to meet certain qualifications. The apostles were making clear when that came to their attention that uh, this is what they must meet, and you people among yourselves look you out, men, to a point to this task. Bring them to us, and we will officially ordain them to do, to take care of this matter. And what was it? Well, it was, according to the apostles, serving tables. That is, taking care of those people that were neglected in the daily ministration, those widows. And if you'll notice something that gives us a bit on the idea of the wisdom, every one of those men that are listed there in Acts 6, if you look at their names, they're Greek names. They were like Paul, or as he was, Saul of Tarsus. They were raised outside of Judea. And by the way, if you study some of that, you'll see that the Jews who lived in Judea tended to look at the Jews outside of what we nowadays call Palestine or the modern state of Israel. Sort of, I don't know whether we can trust these folks or not. <laughs> because that's just how narrow they were beyond the narrowness of the law of Moses. They just didn't trust. In fact, they had that same viewpoint of those that came from Galilee. So there was this problem. There were prejudices here. And this was beginning to be dealt with as you look at it in Acts 6, 1 through 6. Now the apostles said, we don't need to be taken away from the work that only we can do. And that was teaching the Word. Their service allowed the apostles to focus on what God, through Christ, called them to do and qualified them to do. While others who were trustworthy and mature could take care of these particular matters. Now that sets up the idea, and there's no elders mentioned here, that sets up the idea that the Lord's people have always been concerned about those who couldn't help themselves. And you see it taken care of here. Now it wasn't the work of deacons per se, we talked about that this morning, to preach the gospel of Christ. There's no qualification that says in order to be a faithful deacon, you must be a preacher of the gospel in the sense that we talked about the evangelist this morning. Barnes says no qualifications were mentioned implying that they were to be preachers of the gospel. It's just not. But I've always called um, Philip a preaching deacon. <laughs> I think we got one of those here at least. At least. Maybe two. Maybe three if he wants to. <laughs> But it doesn't mean that that's their main work. You can see that in the description, the qualifications, and in the work they did. Acts 6, 5, Acts 8, 4, chapter 21, verse 8. So the work of deacons is to administer to a great extent the physical needs of the church, to get these things carried out. Um, a lot of times we don't want to have to do the detailed things necessary to raise up deacons, and by that I mean see that they understand what the qualifications are and they meet the qualifications, and then what the work is. It's all too easy for elders to jump there and just go do it. But when they do, they did, really they transgress what the Lord said ought to be done. I can just see those apostles on, on the time that uh, they were dealing with the neglect of the, or taking care of the matter of what they thought was neglect at least of the Grecian widows, saying, oh, we'll do this because we can get it done. We don't have to put up with it. Have some of you ladies ever tried to teach a daughter or a granddaughter to cook? You remember an ad a long time ago? Some of you are old enough to remember it. I'd rather do it myself. Well, what are they meaning by that? I don't even know what they were talking about. I don't remember right now. But that was part of it. Sort of like the old lady 50 years ago said, where's the beef? 
this kind of thing. That was kind of stuck. I'd rather do it myself. Why do people say that? You ever ask yourself the question? Because they don't want to take the time of having to deal with the mistakes somebody makes where they can go ahead and do it and get it done right. But you don't teach people very, very well when you do that, and you don't train them very well when you do that, and you're not following the organization the Holy Spirit laid down the way the Lord wants it done. I think I made that plain enough. The work of deacons is to be involved in the things we're talking about. As I said, the right-hand men and the elders to carry out these things. And deacons need to understand that's what they're doing. Now, looking at some of these qualifications here, 1 Timothy 3 and verse 8 is an interesting one. Talking about there ought to be people who are grave or they ought to be serious. They ought to be men of dignity. They realize just how serious their work is in doing it. They're holding the mystery of the faith, the pure conscience, 1 Timothy 3, 9. I really wish there could be a poll done among deacons that can explain, that would have them explain, what do you think that means in view of the fact that before you can be a deacon acceptable to God, you've got to, you've got to do that, hold the mystery of the faith, the pure conscience. Well, what it means is you thoroughly understand the fundamentals of New Testament Christianity. From the plan of salvation to the church, its organization, work and worship. Do you think Philip was, uh, as a deacon, was preaching all that stuff and he didn't know anything about it? He was using Peter's outlines. <laughs> well, of course not. Look at the word mystery. It means that which had been concealed or hidden, but it's now revealed. wonder what that is. Why it's, it's having to do with the gospel, the New Testament system of salvation, Romans 16, 25 through 26, and Ephesians chapter 3, verses 3 through 5. He says, the faith. We've mentioned this at other times, such as when Jude said we were to contend for the faith. It's where grammarians call it a synecdoche. It means we're part. Stands for the whole thing, or the whole thing for a part. And as it's used here, the mystery of the faith is where a significant, important part of the way men are saved is pulled out to stand for the whole New Testament system. That's what is being said here. You know, we still wouldn't know just exactly how God saved people if it wasn't for the revelation of the New Testament. So the faith refers to that which is believed. It refers to the gospel, to the word of truth. He says with a pure conscience, without hypocrisy. That's all that means. First Timothy 1 verse 19 speaks about that directly. Hypocrisy is pretending to be that which you know you are not. The Bible has a lot to say about that. It's living a lie is what it's doing. A deacon should hold firmly the great doctrines of the Christian religion. This is Barnes in his commentary, which had been so long concealed from people, which were now revealed. The reason is obvious. Though not a preacher, yet his influence and example would be great, and a man who held material error ought not to be in office. That's what Barnes said. That's a quote. They're to be tested. Before a man's appointed a deacon, he really is already doing the work of a deacon. He's proved by his actions that he's trustworthy. And the idea is test or proved. He's being found blameless. Well, that doesn't mean he has no room for growth and development. It means that you can't launch any accusation against him and prove it because he's not guilty. 1 Timothy 3.10 and before being officially appointed as deacons, that's the idea of let them show themselves to be really doing the work of deacons or servants who are dependable and trustworthy. You'll notice that if you go back to Acts 6, and let this have a bearing on this, that you'll see that the apostles said there ought to be men of good reputation. Well, what's a man's reputation among brethren? 
they're trustworthy, Acts 6 3. The people who you can take them at their word. If they say they'll do it, they'll do it in the best way possible. 1 Timothy 3 12 says, The husband of one wife. In the Greek, literally, it's a one woman man. It doesn't say the children have to be Christians, but it says that he has children and he rules his own house well. 1 Timothy 3 12. Ruling there means what the New Testament teaches regarding the responsibility of a husband as the head of his house. That would mean he's loving his wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. He's considering her as the weaker vessel, which means he has to know her responsibility before God in being a wife and mother. Thus, he's understanding that and her part as being a good homemaker, what's entailed in that, guiding the home so, 1 Timothy 3, 12 means he can rule his children in his house well. Thus, he must have children, and they must be under control, 1 Timothy 3 and verse 4. Now, that doesn't mean that kids won't be kids. But I always hear that, well, kids are kids, and I say, yes, and that's when parents need to be parents. You don't expect kids to act like kids. Paul used that analogy. If I was a child, the thoughts of a child, and so on. When I became man, put away childish things. Well, between the two, somebody's being trained up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Somebody's being corrected and guided and taught, a good example set. So it's obvious what ought to be. And if the man who is to be a deacon, appointed a deacon, is living like he ought to, as we've already studied, then he's doing all these things. There's some specific negative qualifications here, too. 1 Timothy 3 and verse 8 talks about being double-tongued. The Indian used to say, white man speak with forked tongue, and he did a lot. <laughs> say one thing to this person about a matter, but then to another person you say something completely different. Well, that's hypocrisy. Clark said in his commentary, speaking one thing to one person and another thing to another on the same subject. Well, we know a lot of people that do that. A lot of them running for public office. But there are folks who are that way, and a deacon can't be. No Christian should be, should they? Clark also said this is hypocrisy and deceit. This word might also be translated liars. So they're not to be liars. They're to be people of truth. They tell the truth. You can take them at their word. If they say they'll do it, they're going to do it or try. As you go on further, not giving to much wine. It means not being addicted to, to much wine. You know, people, again, look back at wine as it was in those days. And wine comes from oinos, which is a general term for, for grape juice of any kind. Could mean alcoholic, but it doesn't necessarily mean. But we get our English word wine, and we tend to use it strictly as an alcoholic beverage when we think of the word wine. And so people will read the New Testament or the Old Testament and read wine and automatically think it always, in every case and situation, means an alcoholic beverage. It does not. But they didn't also have it in bottles telling you how much alcohol is in it and so forth. You know, it takes wine juice, wine juice, grape juice, to make alcoholic beverage. And when they put them in wine skins as they held things in those days, still do a lot of those places in the nomads in the Middle East, still put stuff in goat skins and things like that. There was no way to be just real careful that that thing wouldn't go to fermenting. And people who were long at the wine, though they might be drinking some of it, not intending necessarily to start out getting drunk, but if they make it a habit of drinking all that all the time, they could end up drunker than Cooter's goat. It's pretty drunk. <laughs> so, nevertheless, not given to much wine. So the idea is he's self-controlled. He's not going to allow himself to get into a position to drink that stuff. He's particular, particular around it as to what he drinks. Because, as I say, there's no way to measure what that grape juice is going to do once it gets into the wineskins. Jesus alluded to that when it comes to the truth that he would bring. You don't put 
new wine and old wineskins. Why? Because those old wineskins have stretched as far as they're going to stretch. And when the ferment process starts, they're going to pop. So you don't do that. He was using what they thoroughly understood every day. And if they stored their wine, grape juice, there was a good chance it was going to start going the other way. People say, well, I just don't understand that. Well, I'm making it before you do or not. That's the way it worked. And I've seen brethren, refrigerators and everything else, let the wine go bad. And lo and behold, you didn't find out about it until you turn and take the Lord's Supper. And then knock top your head off. Well, people can do that nowadays by letting it slip. They didn't mean to. What do you think about in those days? Where were the refrigerators? It wasn't there. So you've got to realize these things were set to the time in which they were given, but the truth comes right on over to us. In fact, if you look at this, you'll see that even the pagan priest on, on entering the temple, according to Barnes, didn't drink wine at all. If pagans who had no knowledge of God under the Old Testament or Christ knew what it would do, and they didn't care much one way or the other, then it ought to cause us to think particularly about things like that too. And that's the reason the qualification is there. But I've seen some people say, well, it didn't say, don't take any wine. It just don't drink much wine. Trying to justify the drinking of alcoholic beverage. And the deacon can take a little bit, the elder can touch it. Now think about that, brethren. We have brains God gave us to think with. Think about the qualifications in both cases, being very mature Christians, setting godly examples, and then you're going to say, that's what it means. The use of wine, strong drinks of every kind, among the Jews were prohibited. Leviticus 10 and verse 9. Now, why should it then be thought strange, I guess is the way to put it, that such would be set out in the New Testament concerning such matters as this. They're not to be greedy for money, greedy of filthy lucre, which means fond of sordid gain, 1 Timothy 3.8. If you've got men who are covetous and unscrupulous, as to how they're going to line their pockets, fill their bank accounts. They're not to be chosen. That's one reason that men are already what they ought to be before they're ever appointed as a deacon. They've already proven their honesty, their integrity in all of their conduct. Barnes says, the special reason why this qualification was important to the deacon was that he would be entrusted with the funds of the church and might be tempted to appropriate them to his own use instead of the charitable purposes for which they were designed. Now, if you don't think money has caused trouble in the church, you've forgotten what the first sin was in the church of Jerusalem. And it was money. We gave so much, but they didn't. Peter said, and I far lied about it. But they wanted the people to think we sold the land and what we've given is everything we got for that land. Why would people do that? How did God feel about that? Struck both of them dead in the moment. Is that a message for us today? Comes down to qualifications for wives, and I'll add this on this morning before I get into that. I didn't mention a thing about qualifications for wives when it comes to the preacher because I can't find any. Other than she's to be a godly person. What any woman ought to be. Now I say that because I want to add it to this. I've seen situations where preachers were coming to talk to elders about working with that church. And it would come up, well what's your wife able to do? What's she going to do? Well, you know, she's not me as preacher. I'll tell you what she's going to do. She's going to be my wife and do what any other woman who's a godly woman is going to do in that church in service to God. Now, if you want to employ her, that's when you shut down elders right there. If you want to pay her a salary to do something, then uh, that's all right. They're not, they're not expecting that. My wife has never been Ms. Preacher. She's been David Brown's wife. 
and she's been doing what she's supposed to do in that area, and I don't know what I'd done without her. Because no great preacher, no bad preacher, whatever, can do whatever they set to do without some wife to support them. On the same side, a wife can pull a person down and destroy him. And I've seen some of that kind of thing happen with preachers. But now back to the qualifications regarding the wives of deacons. Some people don't like the idea of if you call somebody woman. Well, in that day and time, it was a proper way. As Jesus did his own mother, he'd say, woman, what have I to do with thee? Well, I think they would like it better than using the Greek word translated woman, gune. Sit down, gune, and be quiet. I don't think they would like that. But that's the word, gune. Thayer says it's a woman of any age, whether a virgin or married or a widow. A wife or a betrothed woman, same person. That's in his Greek-English lexicon. Now, there are different views, and I want to just talk about this because they exist. And I'll tell you what I think the Bible teaches on it, and I finish. Paul thinks, or not Paul thinks, but certain people think that when he talks about uh, deacons, he's talking about deaconesses. But this is a thing when you look at the qualifications that is an office. Every person is a servant and every woman in that sense is a deaconess. Women serve and they do some things the men ought to keep their nose out of. I'll give you an example. When we have somebody that's a female that wants to be baptized at the end of the indentation, who trots over there to help her dress? All the men or the women. Their deaconess is when they do that. They're doing what's proper to them. Sonia is employed by the church as a secretary. She's a deaconess. That's not a title in the sense, unless she wants to run John, then he can always say you're serving the authority of the elders. <laughs> But the point is, is that you can't confuse these words. You can't find in the New Testament where there's an office of deaconesses. You can find Paul talking about the widows. Verse 9 of 1 Timothy 5, Let not a widow be taken into the number under threescore years old, having been the wife of one man. That's qualifications they must meet. Well reported of good works. She have brought up children. She have lodged strangers. She have washed the saints' feet. She have re relieved the afflicted. If she have diligently followed every good work. But the younger widows refuse. In other words, evidently there were widows that were put in charge of others. Well, if we can have a secretary taking care of such things the secretary do, and it can be a woman, then you can have women put in charge of a number of things. Sometimes I think some of us are more like a, a lot of the folks under the Muslim view. The woman ought to walk about 10 paces behind. Unless his daddy said World War II when they're in North Africa, they're walking through a minefield and the old Arabs are making women and kids and all walk well ahead of them. You think, well, that's just a bunch of stuff. No, it's not a bunch of stuff. You just need to study about how they are. So this is women in general. But wouldn't we say that every woman is a servant? Certainly so. We'd look at Tabitha. She made all of what she did, and they showed it to Peter after she died before he raised from the dead. It's all these things she would do in a benevolent way to help the widows. So those who believe it refers to a female deaconess as an order of it, they have no New Testament authority to do that. Now, I know that Phoebe's called a servant from diakonos of the church in Romans 16, 1 and 2. That doesn't mean it's an office. Rather than I can say the same thing about Sonia's work with this church. She's a servant of the church. Now, if she's not in her service to the Lord, what in the world is she? Seems to me that what she does, the secretary, is doing the things pertinent to the things of the church. 
Now I understand all that's said about the women who are the wives of the deacons or all that. None of them, whatever they're doing, can usurp the authority as is taught by Paul also that a woman is not to exercise dominion over the male, so she's going to work in that capacity, obviously. Now, when you come down to the what's called the post-apostolic church, you can find various things transpiring there, but we shouldn't appeal to that to determine what is right or wrong regarding bishops, preachers, deacons, deaconesses, whatever. That's not our authority. It's the New Testament of Christ that's our authority. I just simply will point out to you there's no authority for the office of a deaconess. It's that simple. And without authority, we ought not act. Because faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God, Romans 10, 17. And we're to walk by faith and not by sight, 2 Corinthians 5, 7. So, since faith comes by hearing the Word of God, we're to walk by faith and not by sight, we conduct ourselves as the Word of God teaches. And we need to understand that about these words. I don't know of a church I've ever been involved in where many women didn't have certain unofficial capacities, just as the men do. Now, they may say some men need to be helping them more, but when we have the meal next week, the Lord willing time goes on, you tell me how many men are back there behind that counter getting the food already and whatever else. Well, they're being servants of the church. If they're not, what are they doing? Usually when I get in the kitchen at home, if I do something to cook, I have to do it and Jody's not there because she runs me out. I'm in her way. The kitchen's too small. <laughs> so I try to get in there and do what I do a little bit when she's somewhere else. Unless I have to ask her a question. And I do most of the time. <laughs> so whether the wives of deacons or women in general, then the wives of deacons should be reverent, that is, grave, dignified, and serious. First Timothy 3.11, chapter 3, verse 8. Not to be slanderers nor malicious gossips. First Timothy 3.11. And you see this said something about the young widows in chapter 5 and verse 13. That'll be temperate, which we mean sober. They're serious-minded. They're not giddy goofuses, as we commonly say, uh, blondes. And that, put that in quotes. They're, they're, they're people who know what their husband's doing because they've helped him qualify to be what he is, First Timothy 3.11. Same thing be said when it comes to elders and their wives. And First Timothy 3.11 says, faithful in all things. And that's important to understand. He even says that about uh, elderly widows in chapter 5 and verse 10. So when you look at the organization of the church that Jesus purchased with his blood, of which he is head, ruling over it now at the right hand of God, ruling over it through the teaching of the New Testament, then we have to want to know these things about the qualifications of elders, and deacons, preachers, and teachers, and so on. It's all part of the functioning of that church as the Lord Jesus Christ, our sovereign king, wants it done. It's his church, and to keep it his church, we must be willing to submit to his will. Now you tell me how the church is going to be his church without the members submitting to his will. It can't be. So there's always the need to be sure what we believe, and what we practice is according to the authority of our Lord and Master and King of Kings if we're to go to heaven. We would do well to remember that when our Lord says to the saved on his right hand, well done, thou good and faithful servant, it's going to cover all that business of the elders and their work and the deacons and their work and the evangelists and their work and their families. All that's involved in it as to how we conduct ourselves under the headship of Christ. So those who serve well as deacons will be greatly blessed for all they obtain. A good standing, as I said in the beginning, that is highly regarded by the Lord, Matthew 20, 25 through 28, and great boldness in faith. I think you see that coming out in Philip in his teaching, but he was a servant of the church first. 
confidence or assurance that they have in their work because it's under the authority of Christ, 1 John 4, 17. So we cannot take the work of deacons lightly. And of course, nothing that the Lord teaches regarding the church or becoming a member of his church, that blood-bought institution, it wouldn't exist if he hadn't shed his blood, can be taken lightly, but must be soberly, seriously, reverentially. If you're not a child of God this afternoon, you have another opportunity to become one. Now, in view of what you know about the Bible, ask yourself the question now. If you died now, would heaven be your home? If you're outside of Christ, it wouldn't, and you're accountable to Him for your actions. So you have another opportunity to believe in Christ and manifest that in repentance. Acts 17.30 Confessing your faith in Him and being baptized into Christ for the rest of sin. Now, as a time to do that, you don't know whether you have, you, you don't know whether you ever get home tonight or not, whether you ever get out of this building. But you know you've got that opportunity, and God knows it too. If you need to obey the gospel, now's the time to do it. Or if you need to repent of sins that need to be confessed before the congregation, we encourage you to do that too, so we can pray with you and for you for your forgiveness. If you need to respond to the Lord's invitation, we invite you to do so while we stand and while we sing.